Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's RSIS webinar. My name is Evan Resnick, and my job today is to serve as your moderator for the next hour and 20 minutes. Uh, without, any further, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome today's speaker, who comes to us all the way from a rapidly imploding United States of America, Dr. Adam Garfinkel. Uh, as you know from the bio attached to your email for today, uh, Dr. Garfinkel is the Distinguished, distinguished Visiting Fellow at uh, the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. He's also the founding editor of the American Interest Magazine. He was editor of the National Interest Magazine and the principal speechwriter to the U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell, among many, many other things. Uh, we've gotten to know Adam well over the last year, and he has agreed to uh, participate in another, in a, in a series of RSIS webinars, even though he's already returned home uh, now for, he's been home now for about a month. Uh, today, Adam will speak about the Black Lives Matter movement and its implications for international relations and American foreign policy. Uh, this couldn't possibly be a more urgent uh, topic to discuss given the events of the last week in Kenosha, Wisconsin and the death of Jacob Blake. Uh, at the hands of the uh, Kenosha Police Force. So uh, Adam has promised me that this time he will speak for no longer than an hour and 14 minutes, leaving at least a good 60 seconds for audience questions and answers. So uh, if I may, I'd like to turn the, uh, turn the discussion over to our speaker, Dr. Adam Garfinkel. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Evan. Um, it's wonderful to hear you say good morning when it's not here. I mean, it's, it's bedtime. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's always kind of a, a problem if you go to a, a talk, an academic kind of a talk or a policy oriented sort of talk and, and you're worrying about being tired and falling asleep. But let me tell you something, folks, it's much worse if you're the presenter. <laughs> so I'll try to keep awake and uh, you can do anything you want. You know, uh, Evan made a little joke about um, my, uh, my failed attempts to, to limit, limit the uh, introductory parts of these, of these programs. And he's absolutely right. And I really did, I really did try hard to find a way to, to compress and limit what I wanted to actually say and leave time for questions and answers. But I think I picked the wrong topic. This is really a capacious subject. Uh, it's one of the oldest subjects um, pertaining to American history and politics. And it fits, it flows right now into a context that is very difficult to understand. A lot, of what, a lot of what we're seeing, a lot of what we saw um, after May 25th, after George Floyd was, uh, was, was killed in uh, Minneapolis, and even now with uh, what's happening in Kenosha, uh, these kinds of things have happened before and there have been um, uh, mass protests and, and uh, urban violence over these issues. Um, and, and they go away. I mean, if you think back to uh, th those of you who are old enough to remember, if you think back to 1968, say after the assassination of Martin Luther King, which was uh, preceded by the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy and a, a police riot at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, uh, the level of, uh, of urban unrest um, dwarfed uh, what we're seeing right now, but it went away. Uh, uh, the underlying structural problems didn't necessarily go away, although a great deal of progress has been made in my view over time. But what's different now is not the actual events. Um, what's different is the context in which the events fit. And the only way to really do, well, uh, Evan also made mention to the, uh, the ongoing implosion of the United States. Um, we'll see if that turns out to be an exaggeration or not. I'm actually not sure. There are so many moving parts to what's happening in the United States right now. And things are moving so fast and in patterns that we are not necessarily used to because of this unusual context that, we, that these events are, are are bouncing around and settling in, uh, you either have to be a psychiatrist or need a psychiatrist to claim that you really understand all the things that are going on. You have to be a little berserk yourself in order to understand uh, what can only be described as a highly uh, abnormal uh, circumstance. So, I, you know, I do the best I can. I have a couple of comments I want to make. Some of them I think are going to um, hit, a lot of the, hit a lot of you in the audience the wrong way. I'm doing that quite deliberately. I'm going to be pretty provocative about some things I say. Um, and hope that it, uh, it gins up a little bit of, of conversation that's, uh, that you find useful. There's no way in the world we're gonna cover all of this subject. I mean, we would need weeks, we would need semesters, we would need a lot of time. Uh, so all that I can really do is be a little bit provocative, maybe a little bit informative, 
uh, and speak telegraphically about some of the issues that I think uh, don't get uh, enough attention, but that are important in understanding what's happening. Uh, so let me cover, first of all, what I think are, what I would call first layer or obvious and sort of superficial implications of what's been happening uh, in the United States for uh, international relations and, and, and American foreign policy. And that's the title of the talk. So you can't, you shouldn't really just totally ignore the, uh, the title of the talk. Well, there's been a lot of attention on what's been happening in the United States and that's natural. Um, you know, for all the problems the United States has and for, for all the, uh, the rising uh, uh, other countries, competitors, friends, what, it, what have you over the past 30, 40 years, the United States is still considered by most people primus inter pares. And uh, uh, whatever, whatever you wanna say about the flaws of American society and its political system, uh, we are telegenic. Uh, we do put on a show. We are noisy. Uh, we are interesting to a lot of people. Uh, we are unpredictable as well. And so the news of what, what happened in Minneapolis and then what happened uh, elsewhere and then what's happened lately in Kenosha, uh, partly because of the saturation capability of American media and the connections with international media nowadays, I mean, this stuff has gone on, gone on all over the world. And uh, talk about context, these, this kind of news when it, when it sits in other, other countries' infospheres, if you know the, the phrase infosphere, um, it tends to get uh, interpreted in ways that are special to that particular country. So we know, I mean, I mean, I haven't been following in any kind of great detail every permutation of uh, how this news has affected, you know, 194 countries around the world. And I'm not going to sit here for the next half an hour and give you a list of, of how this, this news has been received and how it's been interpreted and how it's been used uh, in, in various countries around the world. Uh, the, the most obvious uh, uh, country that has had a knock-on effect from this is, is the United Kingdom where um, statues have been, that have been standing in front of uh, austere universities for years have been, you know, uh, 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 complained about, uh, had blood thrown on them, had been removed or toppled and so forth. Um, in other countries, I mean, I, I little snatches of things here and there, of things that I, I see almost by accident. So I noticed, for example, in the Indian press, some parts of the Indian press, there's been a certain amount of gloating over this. Uh, you know, anti-Americanism has a long tradition and there are lots of reasons for it that differ from place to place. One is just envy of the number one country, which the United States has been uh, for the most part of the post-World War II period. But sometimes the, uh, the criticism gets uh, pretty hypocritical. Uh, and uh, I, I note this in some places. I mean, it reminds me of a letter I got uh, a couple of months ago from, um, from a South Asian fellow, Singaporean, but not living in Singapore. Uh, it was a passive aggressive uh, kind of a letter after some presentation that I made. This guy wrote me and he proceeded to, re to iterate in his note all the, all the great sins of American history, the genocide of the American Indians and slavery and civil war and so forth and so on, you know, as if, as if uh, the, uh, uh, the sins of racism and, and uh, imperialism and slavery and misogyny and mass murder and war, as if these things were unknown uh, to Asia and Africa before Europeans found these places in the 15th century. I mean, that's just a historical nonsense. Uh, human nature is what it is, and it's uh, it's not universal, but it certainly does spread in 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 uh, uh, discernible patterns. Uh, all these terms that I just used, you know, racism, imperialism, sexism, whatever the all these terms, these were terms invented in the West, and they were invented to problematize the circumstances that they that they described in order that they might be remedied. And uh, some remedies over time, over the past couple of centuries have been, have been put in place. I mean, I think you'd have to say that if you use uh, the term liberal in a fairly broad, but you know, common sense, sense term, that the world is a far better place morally today than, than it was 250 years ago or 300 years ago. Uh, for that matter, uh, just think of the United States uh, and the allies at the end of World War II, when the, you know, Pax Americana really, really sort of begins. Uh, the United States is a far more tolerant and liberal place today than it was in 1946. So it's not like the world has stood still uh, and that, you know, the role of the West has been entirely noxious and evil uh, uh, throughout, you know, throughout the planet. So there's a certain amount of hypocrisy and that goes, that goes along with some of the anti-Americanism and people who are gloating over America's problems right now uh, may regret it <laughs> because if there is no relatively, relatively dis disinterested um, provider of, um, of global common security goods and order, uh, then uh, the kind of world we're likely to see uh, if the United States abdicates or is pushed from its 
from its traditional position or you know removes itself which is what the current administration is trying to do i don't know that the world is going to be a whole lot simpler prettier or nicer for most people as a result of it so uh so much for the anti-americanism that that uh, that has had a heyday in a way as a result in some places as a result of what's been happening in american domestic society i mean clearly what's been happening has has harmed the american reputation and uh, reputation matters in international relations. It's not the first time this has happened. I mean, again, we've had we've had racial upheavals, and we've had you know much worse uh, circumstances in the past. And our adversaries in the past, like the Soviet Union, propagandized them, and it's happening again. And it's there's nothing new about it. Again, what's new is the context. Um, another um, another uh, sort of first order uh, implication of what's been happening is that. Obviously, it's another impetus for the United States to turn inward and deal with uh, domestic problems. There are lots of such um, uh, pressures turning the United States inward. Uh, the United States is, has been experiencing institutional decay in explicitly political institutions and in social institutions for a number of years. Um, uh, it's coming together in a kind of a perfect storm right now under unusual conditions of a pandemic and, and other, other factors, an election year. That's what uh, Evan was referring to, I think, in part. Uh, and so people really don't have a lot of bandwidth uh, for uh, for foreign affairs um, right now. And and the kind of support that uh, a constructive international policy requires over time is is has been waning anyway for the past uh, at least eight years. I would say twelve years. And this is certainly going to push it further more further uh, you know inside. That doesn't mean that the United States is going to be completely isolationist and passive over the next several months or years, uh, regardless of who wins. The election on November 3rd, uh, the United States uh, can combine uh, a general disinterest in the world and a certain obsession with its own domestic problems and still lurch out, launch out unilaterally in violence if it feels it has a reason to, if it's threatened, or uh, if opportunist politicians in the United States thinks that, think that scapegoating other countries uh, is useful for their own domestic political circumstances. And we're seeing that right now too. One of these campaigns, uh, you can already sort of feel uh, you know the deliberate instrumentalization of uh, of the virus and uh, and the building of an anti-China, anti-Chinese kind of a campaign. Um, that's not a foreign policy uh, issue. It's a domestic political issue, but it obviously has foreign policy implications. Uh, the mood in the United States right now is so abnormal. There is so much anger, and there is so much anxiety, and there is so much polarization, and so much. And the lava flows of irrationality are the the largest that I've ever seen. And, and they're varied, they, they come in many colors, these irrational lava flows, um, that uh, it, it wouldn't shock me uh, really if, uh, if between now and January or between now and November, uh, that a war would break out. Uh, I, would, I would rate the odds no, you know, no less than 15%, and that's a big number when you're talking about a major war. So I think we're in a very dangerous moment right now, and I think uh, the Chinese government is, uh, also has its, uh, its, its irrational aspects to it. Uh, its leadership too is under a lot of pressure and is uh, and is uh, uh, tempted, I think, to scapegoat. Uh, if uh, there are reinfections in China of the virus in the fall, and if that happens in the United States, and if the flu season compounds everything and creates, uh, you know, symmetrical, virtually symmetrical public health emergencies in both countries, there really is no telling um, what these leaderships might do if there were, God forbid, an accident at sea, let's say, uh, as a result of a freedom of navigation operation by the U.S. Navy. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know. I mean, remember back, those of you who were, who were really old, remember uh, the, the, uh, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Was, was, I think it was in, on June 25th, 19, 1914. No, nobody expected, really, that five weeks later, a major European war would break out that would essentially destroy Europeans, Europeans' uh, uh, suzerainty. Over the, over, but that's what happened. And as a result of nobody thinking it could happen, nobody did anything to prevent it. Um, it would be a really good idea if we were more careful than you know the 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 the, the great minds of Europe were in 1914. I don't see that happening, but it would be nice anyway. So there are reputational um, consequences of of these um, of these events in the United States. There are clearly um, impulses uh, that to, you know to turning inward that are likely to last for a while, I think, and that combine with other aspects of, of uh, irrational flows create a certain point of danger right now, it seems to me, for the next couple of months. Those are implications. And then lastly, in terms of the obvious, uh, uh, the, the nature of, of international media right now uh, uh, enables um, adversaries of the United States, unfriendly countries, 
let's just call, call them Russia, China, and Iran. You can add North Korea if you like, and maybe a few others that don't matter, to, to, uh, to propagandize these issues uh, and to, uh, to use um, uh, uh, fakes and deep fakes and bots and trolls and all kinds of hacking and methods in order to try to exacerbate these problems. Um, it, it's not like, it's not like uh, you know, for example, the Russian government uh, makes up the problems that, that the United States has, but once, once the problems emerge, they're pretty adept at knowing how to make them worse. And so this is a golden opportunity for, uh, for people who, who do that for a day job in, in Russia and more recently in China and Iran. And I'm sure that's happening and it will continue to happen uh, through the election, through the inauguration, assuming we have an election and an inauguration, will continue to happen. Uh, it's a golden opportunity that, that no, no uh, shrewd adversary of the United States would pass up. But I don't think these are very interesting or very important uh, implications of uh, of what's happening of the Black Lives Matter business. I think um, it, the more indirect uh, effects are are far more significant. One is the effect on the election. Um, uh, if you look at the polls right now uh, in the United States, they all they all pretty much show the Democrats, Joe Biden, way ahead. Um, but I would advise uh, anyone who thinks that the, that's a gimme not to trust the polls. Um, as Evan knows, and many political scientists know, most of the polls that you hear about in the United States are not actually social science validated polls. They're businesses and they sell their, their product to newspapers and magazines. It's a business. And um, a, a genuine social, science, a social scientist who does real polling uh, would look at these things and go, wait a minute, the samples are small, uh, the way that the samples are modeled, do they really fit, you know, populist times? Do they really fit? How do you do this sort of thing in the middle of a pandemic, which is I don't think has ever been done before? Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not telling you that Donald Trump's going to win the election. I don't know that. But I'm just telling you, don't be so cocksure about the polls. The polls said something similar four years ago. And as partly as a result of that, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton did not campaign in uh, Michigan or in Wisconsin or in Pennsylvania, and all three of those states went to Donald Trump, and that proved to be the margin in the Electoral College. So don't be sure that you know what's going to happen just because the polls tend to say one thing, um, and it's a news item. Um, I wish I could be sure that that were the case, because I really think that if, if Trump is reelected, uh, and either he or someone like him uh, presides uh, over the Oval Office for the next four years, it's essentially a, it's a, it's an extinction event for constitutional government in the United States and the rule of law. There's no telling what the country would look like uh, after four more years of this. It's bad enough already. It's hard to imagine what four more years would produce. Um, there would be no way back, basically, to anything remotely uh, resembling um, normality after four more years of this. So that's a, that's a, that's a significant, that's a very significant implication of, of, the, of the domestic unrest and Black Lives Matter. Um, how, how is Black Lives Matter playing into this? I mean, how is what we've seen playing into this? Well, it's very ambiguous. Uh, you, can, you can make an argument that it, that it points this way or that way. Um, let me just uh, uh, sort of show my hand here a little bit and tell you that um, uh, there's, a, there's an almost schizophrenic um, distinction between Black Lives Matter as an organization, as part of a wider movement that has a kind of a political uh, ph a philosophy behind it on the one hand, and the slogan Black Lives Matter on the other. My own view is that the, on balance, the, re the reaction after May 25th to the George Floyd killing, uh, the reaction was one of the best things that's happened in the United States in years. It shows that people in the United States still have a moral pulse, that they still care about making progress when it comes to issues of racial justice, when it comes to issues of, of dealing with uh, the, the large residual amounts of, of bigotry and racism and discrimination and structural, um, uh, structural obstruction uh, to fairness uh, in the United States. And this is an ongoing problem that uh, we've had for, well, for centuries. I mean, the, the uh, Europeans landed in um, uh, Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, and within 12 years, there were already uh, African slaves being deposited on North American soil. This is, a, this is a problem that goes back a couple centuries, and you don't solve it, you know, overnight with a couple of, a couple of uh, voting rights acts and, and, some, uh, and some, uh, uh, some welfare to poor people and, and a couple of affirmative action. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Uh, the, the wounds in culture are very deep. It takes a long time to solve them. Uh, so I think every generation has to rediscover uh, the, the, the depth and the character of the problem. And that's, and that's what I think we saw after May 25th. 
Now, of course, <clears throat> there were some, there were ugly things that happened. Not all of it was, not all of it was integrated. Not all of it was, un, it was nonviolent. And uh, there were basically two, two sources of the violence that we saw, uh, first in Minneapolis, but then spreading to many, many other cities. Um, one, uh, in some cases, Minneapolis being the first case and, and sort of the, uh, the iconic case was, uh, this was a tactical judgment on the part of the city fathers not to send police and firemen out into these neighborhoods that were, that were rioting, that were looting. Um, and the reason is because they didn't have enough cops and firemen to deal with it. And the judgment that they made was that sending people into the lurch when emotion was so high um, and uh, intelligence about what was happening was so low that it would produce more black on blue violence and it would just make things worse. So that was a prudential judgment that um, some city fathers made. And I, you know, it's hard, it's hard, to, it's hard to, uh, to gainsay that judgment because unless you're there and you see it and you know how those places work and you know how many cops you have and you know what, what cap capacities you have, you know, I, I, I certainly wouldn't be, be quick to, you know, to, to gainsay their judgment. But on the other hand, there, were, there, were, there was a lot of looting. There were just you know, hoodlums in, uh, in a lot of these poor neighborhoods. And they took advantage of the fact that the cops weren't out. And the first thing they usually do is smash the liquor store and, and you know, loot the booze. And that has nothing to do with George Floyd. And that has nothing to do with racism. Well, it does in a way, but not, not directly. It, has nothing, it, it isn't protesting uh, you know, police brutality. It's something entirely different. But every city is a little different. Now, Lori Lightfoot in Chicago, different problem. Uh, there's a black mayor in Richmond, Virginia, slightly different situation. Uh, uh, the real exceptions, uh, at least so far as I, I've been able to tell, is what's been happening in Seattle and in Portland, Oregon, where the mayor and the, and the, the city authorities basically support, supported the protesters and, and refused to back the police. Now, this has now been going on for a few months, and we're seeing secondary and tertiary ways of thinking about what's been happening, differs from, differs from place to place, but here's some of the things that have been happening. Uh, you know, if you burn down your own neighborhoods in the inner cities, if you loot the stores and then burn down the stores, you don't have any place to buy food. Uh, and this is becoming a problem. Uh, and it's, uh, it's in some cases caused uh, unrest to spread beyond these neighborhoods. Uh, it's caused more crime. Uh, uh, both violent crime and other kinds of crime have mushroomed in the cities where the police have either been pulled back for prudential reasons or for political reasons, or because the police believe that the political authorities don't have their back and they don't get out of their patrol cars because they're afraid and not for no reason in a lot of cases. So what you're seeing now is uh, sort of the bedrock, uh, 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 mostly conservative folks in the black community calling for more pro police protection. So on the one hand, you have, you have uh, Antifa types and black, some Black Lives Matter types talking about abolishing the police and having, you know, uh, reconceiving, you know, community safety. And this is a, this is, I mean, that, they, must, they must think that people are morons if they say that and expect to be taken seriously. I mean, what it really comes down to is simply a license for, you know, for, for mayhem and looting. And that hurts most, you know, the people who are the bulwarks of those communities. And it hurts, you know, the minority owned businesses in those communities. So right now you can't get insurance to, you know, to, to start or reopen a business in a lot of these places. Uh, and a lot of these businesses will never be reopened. I mean, you know, I'm from Washington. I remember the 1968 events in Washington and parts of Washington were boarded up and property values went through the toilet for a decade and more. And it changed, it changed the face of the city. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening all over the place. Now, in addition, what you're seeing is you're seeing a lot of people who have the means to, to leave the cities, leaving the cities. Now, some of this has to do with COVID. So it's very difficult to separate, you know, which people are leaving uh, the cities because, you know, they want to de-densify their circumstances and which are leaving because they're just afraid to be in a city where, where, uh, where there's no, no, no order and no security. Uh, you're also seeing in the United States an astonishing increase in the number of gun sales, which is truly, truly horrifying. I mean, it was all, you already saw this uh, back in late May and early June, but it's only gotten worse. I can't imagine what, what, the, what the numbers look like after what's been happening in Kenosha and what's been happening in Seattle and what's been happening in Portland. And now you have the mobilization, by the way, the QAnon types and the militias in certain places. You have mobilization of, of right-wing types on the opposite side of this. And you saw in Kenosha, I mean, after, uh, after uh, uh, the initial event, you know, um, uh, after Jacob Blake was, was shot, you saw uh, a 17-year-old, a seemingly you know, militia-related sort of person uh, kill two people uh, in a crowd. So now you've got direct engagement. 
Now, this is not the same as, you know, communists and Nazis on the streets of Weimar, Germany in the 1930s, not yet, but it kind of smells a little bit like that in some ways. Um, and anybody with a little bit of historical, you know, memory, you know, kind of gets a little nervous about stuff like that. So we, we've had in the United States for years already, uh, what a lot of people have called a cold civil war, which is a nice little, you know, conjunction of cold war and civil, cold civil war. Well, it's, it's, it's not necessarily as cold as it was right now as, as it was, you know, a year or two ago. There is political violence uh, and, and there is likely to be more political violence. It may, it may very well be that on November 3rd, November 4th, we won't know that night or the next morning who won the election. There are several factors that are, that are weighing down uh, sort of a, a, a sort of a normal standard election night. Uh, you have the pandemic, uh, you have uh, uh, voter suppression efforts by, the, by Republicans on the national level and state levels. You have hacking, not just by the Russians this time, but also by other countries. It's not likely, I don't think, that we're going to know who, who wins this election um, uh, uh, on the morning of November 4th. Who knows how long this could go on and what might happen in between. Um, so uh, this, as I say, this is very, very unusual. Um, so clearly, it seems to me, if uh, you look at history, uh, the, I, I mentioned some of the things that happened in 1968. 1968 was a presidential election year, as you, as you probably know. You had the riots at the Democratic Convention, you had assassinations, uh, and uh, Richard Nixon, who was not the incumbent, he was the challenger, but he was running on basically what he called the law and order um, ticket, which was a dog whistle uh, at the time for, um, if not outright racism, then certainly opposition to um, uh, federal efforts at desegregation in some parts of the country. Nixon had a Southern strategy and he wanted to, you know, turn the Southern states from Dixiecrat to Republican and pretty much succeeded in doing it. But there are a lot of people who think that, you know, if it hadn't been for the mayhem, the domestic mayhem, both racial and otherwise, student strikes, things like that, that Nixon would not have won. That was a pretty close election against Hubert Humphrey. And some people now, now speculate that uh, the violence that has been tricked off for whatever reason, you know, whether it's Antifa led, you know, uh, uh, political violence or whether it's just, you know, uh, hoodlums and looting uh, in, in, in a certain, that this is gonna play, this is playing right into Donald Trump's hands. And we've seen already uh, Trump, the Trump, Trump White House's efforts to, 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 to uh, instrumentalize the violence. You saw him order federal agents into, into, uh, into uh, cities around the United States without, the, without talking to the mayors and the people who actually ran these cities. I mean, that's, that's a form of reality TV that Trump understands really well. It really gets people's pulses up. I mean, it really is both suspenseful and um, very uh, conducive to rapt attention on what's happening. Uh, and this is something that Donald Trump knows how to do very well. He knows how to get and keep attention. That's what he's, he's really good at that. He's also really good at, at understanding division, making it worse, and then reaping it, harvesting it for his own political ends. That's what he does best. And even Al Sharpton, not one of my favorite folks over the years, even Al Sharpton in his maturity warned everybody the other day about the violence. He said, this is playing right into Donald Trump's hands. That's what the violence is doing. Now, uh, to mention Antifa, let me just say that the Antifa folks are doing this on purpose. And the Black Lives Matter sort of core organizers are, some of them anyway, doing this on purpose. And they refer to themselves and others refer to them as accelerationists. What do they mean by that? They mean by that, that the worse it is, the better it is. Because their aim is basically revolutionary. It's basically to trash the founding principles of the United States and to overthrow the, the political status quo in the United States. Uh, they're not trying to validate American principles. They're not trying to bring uh, the United States up to its own ideals and standards. Uh, they basically believe that uh, the United States has been uh, an evil blot on humanity from the very beginning, that it has an eradicable sin of, of, of racism, and they really want to destroy the country. So the worse it gets, the more violence there is, the better it suits them. It also helps uh, them uh, raise their profile uh, in terms of the media, it helps them raise money. Now, what's really weird here is that uh, we're talking about very small numbers of people really small numbers of people, tiny numbers of people. Uh, on the right, on the extreme right, we're also talking about pretty small numbers of people, but they play off each other, right? Uh, they're both very telegenic and very radical and they really make news. And we have a news, a news system now in the United States uh, driven by social media that's clickbait oriented. And, and the rest of the media follows the line. And basically the most shocking 
whatever raises the shock bar, that's what that's what you see. And you're seeing you're seeing videos, you're seeing images more than you're reading. Uh, your your uh, your emotions are engaged more than your more than your your intellect and the way the way that the media the media market works nowadays in the United States, and as a result, these two tiny extremes feed each other, and it makes it seem as though they're much more numerous, much more powerful, and much more uh, formidable than they really are. But sometimes you know appearances uh, appearances are reality, and if you think of the way that the media portrays these things in the United States, and you know the phrase that that life imitates art even bad art, well, in some respects, this could be an example of life imit imitating the media in its, in its current state in the, in the United States right now. But this is a very dangerous situation. I, I would say an unprecedented situation. So as I said, uh, the, 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 the core of the Black Lives Matter movement, very small number of people, all right, uh, uh, it's basically a neo-Marxist, it's, it's, uh, it's called critical theory. Uh, I don't want to get into the, the esoterica of the philosophy here, but I will tell you this, if you would like to know more about it in a fairly convenient way, you know, without having to read 10 books, the best thing I've seen lately on this uh, is this, I'll just hold it up. I don't know if it's backwards or forwards when you're looking at it. I think it's backwards, right? But this is by Andrew Sullivan, uh, a uh, indefatigable blogger and uh, a sharp mind. It's called The Roots of Wokeness, and it's in his own thing, The Weekly Dish. Uh, dated uh, 31 July uh, 2020, and you can look it up on the internet very easily. It's, it's a 20-minute read, and uh, you don't have a lot of this stuff in Singapore, at least not as far as I could tell, hanging around universities. So it's very hard for people in Singapore to figure out what the, what this really is, what it means. Uh, it's been it's been sort of developing for 30 some years. It starts out with you know postmodernist stuff, and it it then gets sort of uh, armed and and uh, instrumentalized in the 19. It's it's very complicated. Uh, and I don't, you can, if you want to ask about it, you know, during Q&A, fine, but I don't want to go into it now in any great depth. But again, what's really interesting, uh, the one thing I will say about it is that the underlying model of, of, of human nature that the woke crowd, the so-called social justice crowd has, uh, uh, I would say just a couple of things about it. First of all, uh, it's, depending on how you look at it, it's either pre-enlightenment or post-enlightenment, but it's not enlightenment. Uh, the Enlightenment is distinguished, just to simplify a little bit, by, by three basic premises. And it's important to know what these are because the United States was born in the womb of the Enlightenment, right? Uh, entangled with uh, the Protestant Reformation, which was a coterminous event in, in, the, in the 16th century, based on three basic ideas. The, the uh, elevation of individual agency over communal agency, the importance of the individual. This comes out of Protestant scripturalism. It's a long story. I don't want to go into it. The second is the idea of secularism, not just in politics, but also in the relationship between ecclesiastical authority and the arts. And the third, maybe the most important, is the idea of progress, uh, sometimes referred to, depending on what version, the Whig idea of progress, the idea that moral and material progress go hand in hand, or we hope they will, marching into the future. These are the basic premises on which every American political institution is built. And uh, uh, critical theory and this kind of neo-Marxism and the social justice woke, they, they dispute every single one of these premises. Uh, they don't believe in individualism. A great example, which is quoted in the, uh, in the Andrew Sullivan thing, which I'll quote, I'll quote from, this is, these are the words of uh, Ayanna Presley, who was a Democratic Congresswoman from Massachusetts. Here's what she said. We don't need any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice. And we don't need any more black faces that don't want to be a, a black voice, close quote. In other words, an assertion of individuality in this context, in this intellectual philosophical context, is an attack upon the group. And therefore, it's an enabling of impression, of oppression mounted against the group by, by the white majority. That's the view. And the view is also that uh, the wealth of America and the power of America from the very beginning was built on the exploitation of black and brown people. And not only was that the case in the 1600s and the 1700s and the 1800s, and even after the um, abolition of slavery, but it's still the case today. In other words, this is a, this is a pre-enlightenment way of thinking in the sense that uh, there is, everything is conflictual. It's group oriented and it's conflictual. There are winners and there are losers. There's no possibility of a positive sum outcome. There's no possibility of gradual reform and improvement of circumstances uh, 
there's no slow and steady wins the race. They're just winners and losers. And there's no truth, the postmodern part. There's no truth. There are no facts. It's just who can tell the better, the better story, who has the hegemonic narrative. So there's no possibility for different groups to actually reason out public policy issues and other and political issues together because people think as a result of the membership that they're in as a group. Groups think, individuals don't think. That's the basic premise here. So there's only struggle. Uh, it's only you know us against them, win or lose, there's no middle ground. That's the way these folks actually think. This is neo-Marxist. It goes back to Marxist premises, except you've got, instead of having classes be the units here, you have basically groups, whether it's by color or by gender or some kind of group, all right? That's, that's the basic idea. Now, what's really kind of fascinating, but not very often noted, is that uh, the, sort of the far right, which I will call the Randian right, all right, uh, basically has very similar premises. It's also uh, anti, an anti-enlightenment point of view. Um, the, the, if, you've, if you've ever, uh, if you've had the misfortune to read Atlas Shrugged, which is perhaps the worst novel ever written, uh, I forced myself on the, th the third try to make myself go through it, right? Uh, uh, it, it, every single Abrahamic value that we're taught, uh, most of us are taught, or in Hindu tradition or Buddhist tradition or whatever tradition, Islamic tradition, compassion, mercy, loyalty, service to others, all of these things are believed to be weaknesses, softness, decadence. What, what matters is just the, the heroic empowered individual, right? Uh, and, uh, and all the rest of the stuff is just transactional nonsense, all right? It's just, it's, 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 a, kind of, it's a kind of primitive, you know, pre-Darwin social Darwinism, survival of the fittest, that kind of thing. So that, uh, you know, uh, so that power justifies itself and whoever wins, might makes right. It's very interesting because uh, there's a lot of similarity between the two extremes. They both, they both refuse to understand or, or, or acknowledge the, the possibility of uh, institutions that can modulate positive sum outcomes in society. It's all just a big fight. It's all very Hobbesian, in other words. And you know, it's, it's kind of amusing that they have very similar views. The only difference is you know, the woke types, the social justice types, see this in communal terms and see themselves as losers, as historical victims. Whereas on the Randian right, you know, they see themselves in individual terms and they think, like to think of themselves as the winners. But the underlying premises about human nature are really identical. And you know, Westerners have been having this argument philosophically. This really does matter. I'll get, I'll get back to it. have been having this argument for a long time. So you know, the two famous Western philosophers, Hobbes and uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, basically Hobbes, you know, uh, experiencing the English Civil War, uh, came up with a conflictual model of, of human relations. Uh, basically, it was, you know, nasty, brutish, and short. Life was nasty, brutish, and short. And the only, if you're going to dispense with the divine right of kings, the only way to create a uh, stable order was to have a sovereign. And the sovereign made a deal with the people. You let me protect you, and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, I, I'll, I'll provide law, law, you know, law and order. But the premise here is that everything is conflictual, and everything, life would be nasty, brutish, and short if there were no sovereign. Rousseau, on the other hand, growing up amid the foppery of uh, the French, the French uh, monarchy at the time, basically believed that the problem didn't lay in, in individual human nature, but with the decrepitude and the depravities of civilization. And that at heart, human beings were good and human beings were noble. And this is where the idea of the so-called noble savage comes out of Rousseau. And that you can only get rid of uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the incrustations of, of greed and, uh, and, and bigotry and so forth, people would, would get along pretty well with each other, right? Uh, and in a way, the Rousseauian idea is kind of like the seed in a way of, of anarchism. They that you don't really need the state, that, the orga that human beings are basically cooperative and that the organic, it's also Burkean in a funny way, that the organic sinews of a society allow you to have a very light-handed government because uh, societies that work well are kind of self-regulating um, mechanisms. Uh, internally, and what you really need a state for is protection against others, you know, to make war or to defend yourself against others who want to make war on you. So Hobbes emphasized the conflictual nature, uh, the conflictual uh, uh, aspect of human nature, and Rousseau, most of the time, emphasized the cooperative aspect of human nature. And they were both half right and both half wrong, because I think as anybody can, can, can see, and as other other faith traditions and cultural traditions uh, uh, have, have argued for, for millennia, human, human beings are both 
conflictual competitive, and also cooperative. And that's part of the, the confusing glory of, of who human beings are. So the fact that you know, both the, you know, the Antifa, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, core, core types on the one hand, and the, the, the right wing radicals on the other, both reject these enlightenment premises, both reject the possibility of positive sum outcomes. I think that's very interesting. But again, it's part of the dynamic that helps feed them, because they really do understand each other. They really do think they're in a life and death fight with each other. And here's the irony. As I said before, I think black, the, 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 the phrase Black Lives Matter and the way that it's been used in the aftermath of the George Floyd thing has been a very positive development. People care about this, all right? And most of the people who have Black Lives Matter signs on their front yard or who march uh, in, in protest movements, right? Many of them integrated, almost all of them peaceful, except after dark when the, when the, when the, when the troublemakers come out. They have no idea about this stuff. I mean, if you told them, well, critical the what's critical theory? You know, it comes from a, a merger of Marxism and Freudis Freudianism in the 1920s, and it's the Frankfurt School and Theodore Adorno and, and, and Horka. They don't have any idea. They don't care. I mean, if you, if you take a marble, so to speak, metaphorically speaking, you drop it in any place in the United States, all right, and then you go there and talk to people, they will have no idea what this philosophy or this theory is about, they, and they won't care. And if you explain to them what it is about, they'll think the ideas are pretty much nuts, okay? So it's a very weird thing. Uh, what it means politically, though, uh, and here I'll just try to come to a, to, to a almost conclusion. Okay, there are some people who think that the social justice sort of woke faction, right, uh, is, has basically taken over or is about to take over the Democratic Party. So that anybody who's in a pragmatic, sane center kind of place, uh, which I consider myself, I haven't been a member of either uh, political party, major political party in the United States since 1991. If you're worried that you've been spending the past almost four years fighting against lunacy and irrationality on the right, be starting to worry that if Biden wins for the next four years, you're going to be fighting lunacy and irrationality coming from the left. How much fun is that going to be? All right. I don't know. Uh, you know, I was in Singapore all year, and I sort of lost the tactile sense of what it means to be in Washington and talking to colleagues about these things. I don't know. There are people that I talk to that are smart people, that I trust, that I know, and they say the Democratic Party is toast, right? Biden is 78 years old, and he's going to get rolled. And all the traditional Democrats, Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, and all these people are going to be pushed aside, and we're going to have a woke Democratic Party. Uh, and it's going to be just as crazy from the left as, as the, the Trump Republican Party has been from the right. And then there are others who say, people who are just as, you know, just as mature and serious scholars and, and intelligent people say, nah, Biden hates all this stuff. He hates all this kind of stuff. Obama hates this stuff. I have a quote from Obama that I'd like to read if I, if I can just find it. This is a great thing. If I can find it. If I can't find it, I'll give up. Here it is. This is something that, uh, that, President, that ex-President Obama said in the fall. He was talking to a group of uh, young activists, mostly social justice sort of woke type activists. And he said, quote, this idea of purity and you're never compromised and you're always politically woke and all that stuff, right? You should get over that quickly. The world is messy. There are ambiguities. People who do really good stuff have flaws. People who you are fighting may love their kids and share certain things with you. Um, guess what? Um, when Obama says things like that, the woke crowd doesn't listen to him anymore. Um, but I, I just don't know, because uh, I've been away. Uh, I think we'll see, you know, when we see municipal voting in Seattle and in Portland and in Richmond and in Minneapolis and other places, I think we'll see what, what the electorates do. We'll see who they, who they favor and who they, whom they punish. Uh, when all this, when all the dust is settled, and we'll get some feel for, um, you know, for the balance uh, here, uh, and if there's any chance of sort of um, uh, rewinding or moving forward in a different mode and recovering some of the sanity that seems to have gone missing in the United States. Now, the last thing I want to say, and then I'll stop. Um, well, actually, a couple more things. One point. It's important to to remember the role of 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 the new media in this. If there hadn't been a viral video of George Floyd uh, having this cop put his knee on his neck. A lot of this stuff wouldn't have happened. There had to been a video of what happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Similarly, you know, the cops, 
the problem with the cops is not just racism. The problem with the cop is the, the cops are the, is the militarization of the police in general. And this is a post 911 phenomenon in the United States. That's when military surplus from the government and from the Iraq war started flooding these police departments all over the place. They all decided they wanted their own SWAT, SWAT team, right? Uh, that was a status thing. And then what did they, do they really need a SWAT team? Well, no, not of, most of them really didn't, but are they gonna not accept all this cool stuff, all these neat toys and everything? Uh, and so they started using SWAT teams on drug raids and they killed a lot of innocent people. And by the way, you know, the cops kill white people too. Uh, if it doesn't get on a viral video and the media doesn't think it's, it's noteworthy, you, you never hear about it. Uh, so again, it's the clickbait nature of the media. If you wanna, if you wanna read a great book about uh, the history of the militarization of the police, there's this guy, Radley Balco, who's written this book called uh, The Rise of the Warrior Cop. It's a really excellent book. So for those of you who care about this, um, this is the subject. So it's not true that the punitive nature of law enforcement in the United States is tied indelibly to racism. It overlaps with racism in the United States, but it's not the same thing. So this is, again, it's a point not often made. Um, uh, last, last comment. How do I understand when I try, when I get, try to get my arms around all this, what do I think is really happening? Um, <clears throat> I don't like to think, think of myself as berserk or needing a psychiatrist, but I'm, I'm trying, right, to understand what is really going on. And to me, the, it's the change in the context. Like I said, what this stuff is, is, is falling down into that really matters. And I, I, would, I would say there are three things, three aspects of the context that interweave, that help explain uh, why this time around things look different to me and seem uh, worse to me and seem more dangerous to me than uh, in 1968 to 1970 and in other, you know, historical episodes of, of these irrational lava flows going all the way back, by the way, to the winter of 1692-93 um, in Salem, Massachusetts, where if you were a witch or somebody thought you were, you could be in a lot of trouble. So what do I think is really going on? I think there are three things that, um, that play into this, and I don't have time, I'm just going to mention them. One is <clears throat> the amazing, if you look at the numbers, we're not going to do that. The amazing spread of affluence in the United States, starting after World War II, but really mushrooming in the 1970s and 80s, and especially after the end of the Cold War. If you look at the numbers, and they're just astonishing. Of course, not just the United States, but this level of sudden affluence uh, is, a lot of people have studied it. People have studied the relationship of, of sudden affluence to isolation, uh, to divorce rates, uh, 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 delayed marriage, uh, all, all kinds of social trust hemorrhage, all kinds of things. You know, I, I'm not, I, I, have no, I have no brief for abject poverty, don't get me wrong, but there are downsides to sudden affluence. It's a little bit like, you know, an heir who inherits a fortune from the family business, but doesn't inherit uh, the virtues or, or the characteristics to know what to do with the money. It used to be a TV show back in the 50s called A Millionaire. Some of you are out there old enough to remember this. Every, every, every episode had the same plot, right? This guy shows up and gives, gives this, this person a million dollars. And then the rest of the episode shows how the money ruins their life <laughs> because they, they haven't developed the character traits necessary to manage the, the wealth. It seems to me that, you know, the baby boomers, my generation, right? We just walked into this wealth that we didn't create and that we didn't understand and that we took for granted and that we didn't appreciate it. And we, that we didn't appreciate it. And we have, we, this generation, my generation has let standards fall, has been lax. I don't even want to talk about the drugs. So that's not a small part of what's been happening over the past 35, 40 years in this country. Um, uh, affluence has, is problematical and it's been technologically propelled in recent years to the point where uh, people have so much leisure time and they spend so much leisure time in, in, in front of highly realistic fantasy entertainment that I think you get a shadow effect um, uh, where people, if they, if they subject themselves to this uh, for long enough, they begin to see the world in reality TV or television plot kind of, you know, kind of, kind of simplicities. And that's one of the reasons I think that conspiracy theories are more prevalent now than they were before. Because the plot of a typical mass entertainment movie or television show has to be really pretty simple or people won't understand it. And I think there's a shadow effect. People project that kind of way of thinking, that, that lack of complexity way of thinking, Onto, onto politics, it's like a blood sport. It's, people think about politics the way they, people, people root for sports teams. I mean, it's lost its gravitas. That's one thing. So the affluence is part of it. Second thing, I mentioned before, um, uh, uh, modernity, the, these aspects of modernity, the enlightenment, right? These three characteristics, individual agency, secularism, 
and the idea of progress, all three of these ideas are under attack in the West and in the United States. And, and if, you, if you leave a vacuum, like if you don't teach the stuff, if you don't do civic education, we, there has been si serious civic education in the United States since, since the late 70s. If you don't teach the stuff, you create a vacuum and anything can flow into a vacuum, including you know, critical, critical theory and the woke stuff is flowing into this vacuum among a lot of young people. Again, to what, you know, how much and to what effect people disagree and I don't know. And the third thing, which I've written about, some of you know, is the erosion of deep literacy. If people don't read and they don't read books and they don't read long things, they lose the sense of linearity. They have trouble wrapping their minds around complicated ideas. And again, it simplifies everything. And, and last in this respect, uh, connected to the er erosion of deep literacy, it's these, these, these damn things. Where, where's mine? The phones, the iPhones, right? The circuitry in an iPhone runs at seven times the speed that your brain circuitry works. It speeds us up. If you don't, if you don't, if you're not careful, you can get addicted to your phone. And I mean that in, in neurophysiological ways. I'm not speaking about metaphor here. I mean, there are people who can't stand to be alone. They have to be plugged in all the time. Uh, but the, the technology works so fast that it pulls your brain behind it. And you, you, you feel like you're always kind of in an incipient state of panic because you can't keep up. There are many other effects of social media that we know, and there are many other ill effects of the loss of uh, the, the inferential reasoning capacities when people stop reading. And believe me, the political class in the United States, um, they pretty much stop reading. Uh, these guys don't read anything more than 700 words. Uh, they don't read books. A couple of exceptions. A couple of one senator from Nebraska actually writes books. That's really an exception. Um, but you know, when I, I worked in the Senate um, uh, in the late seventies, and there were great people. There were people who did their own work and their own thinking. There aren't very many people like that left because the whole recruitment character of American politics has changed. The money, the money flow has changed. But these people don't read. They they really have lost the capability of it doing any kind of creative thinking. There are a lot of problems we have in the United States, the solutions to which are not that hard to come up with. All you have to do is sit down and think a little bit, right? But they don't. <laughs> so it's not just the polarization and, you know, and the viscera of the politics. It's that these guys just don't think very, very, very well anymore. Um, I, I really believe that. They're not stupid, but they, they've detrained themselves from the kind of discipline that you need to actually think through difficult public policy problems. Last thing. I promise, last thing. So I think these three changes, uh, uh, sudden affluence, um, sort of the end of modernity or deferred myth maintenance, you could call it, uh, and a vacuum created, and the erosion of deep literacy have changed the context so that America has become an immoderation machine. You drop any, any issue, right, whether it's COVID-19 masks or whether it's George Floyd or Kenosha, or whatever it is, a, a gun policy, immigration policy, you name it. You drop it into this boiling flow of immoderation. And what it does is it creates extremes that the media then will echo back and forth among, among the polarized sides. And everything in the middle kind of drops out, falls away. And that's where we are. And that's why, as Evan said, that, that's what I think he means when he talks about implosion. I mean, that's the pattern that we see now that's getting worse and worse, cascading. That's the pattern that is producing in this election year in particular, a feeling of, of incipient implosion. I think that's actually accurate. Now, again, last point. You know, it's, this is not, again, as I said before, this is not the first time in American history that people have believed a lot of screwy things, uh, whether they've been minorities or not so minorities. Americans, Americans are very energetic uh, and we tend to overdo things and we are very, very, uh, and we have animal spirits to use Keynes's, Keynes's famous phrase, uh, Navy SEAL motto, best example of it. Uh, anything, very American, anything worth doing is worth overdoing and at great expense. That's, that's just who we are, right? Um, part of our creativity and part of our social, our social vigor comes out of that too. So it's not all bad, but there are times when the guardrails fall away, like right now when they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty scary. But, but this, this is a pattern. It's a pattern in American history and it's baked into the, the founding. It's baked into the culture of the founding as much as, as it is the political institutions of the founding. We have had in American history, three discernible, what we call great awakenings. And these are, uh, these are surges of moral panics, basically religious moral panics that, uh, that create the Jeremiah mode of American uh, discourse. We have sinned, we are unworthy, we must atone, we must fix ourselves, we must, re we, we must, we must repent. 
The first one of these is identified with a guy named George Whitfield that started in the 1740s. I don't want to go into any details here, but a lot of people argue that the, the Great Awakening, that surge of, 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 uh, of moral panic that accompanied the, uh, that Great Awakening actually had a lot to do with the origins of the first American Civil War, which we like to call the Revolutionary War between 1776 and 1781. Then in, this, in the 1820s, 1830s, we had the Methodist circuit riders, the tent meeting that's identified with a man named Charles Grandison Finney, Methodists, right? And again, uh, the, the, the effect of this had the, uh, was to brittleize and to theologize political language. And the result, one of the results of it, a lot of scholars have argued, a guy named Adam Goodhart in a book called 1861, excellent book. This was part of the formula that created the Civil War. We had a third great awakening in the 1880s and the 1890s with William Jennings Bryan and the populists and then the progressives uh, with uh, uh, Jennings Bryan's Cross of Gold speech, Dorothy Day and Catholic workers, the social gospel movement. For those of you that know any American history, these, these terms will be familiar. Um, and uh, that didn't cause a war necessarily, but it certainly caused uh, a great tumult in American society. It, and, and the backlash from that was essentially the Ku, Ku Klux Klan. So, uh, not the first time you get the back and forth of this, right? And I think, and I'll, not just me, I mean, this is not even my view, but a lot of historians and social observers believe that starting about 30, 40 years ago, people dated a little differently. We are in now a fourth great awakening. And people are thinking, people are theologizing their politics and their foreign policy. And the kind of brittle language and the kind of extreme language, it has a religious syntax to it, right? And it, you know, I don't want to say that religious thinking is necessarily irrational, not at all, but it's a different kind of thinking than sort of pragmatic politics that most Americans think is sort of like the normal, the normal thing. And I want to read you an example, if I can find it again, and I'll conclude with this, if I can find it. You know, what, I mean, I, I really think you can, you can draw a pretty direct line uh, from some of the Black Lives Matter folks and the Antifa folks and the social justice woke crowd, I think you can draw a pretty pretty direct line uh, to there being a basically a de-churched religious cult, okay? Uh, what What is woke in the 20th century uh, except the 20th century, 21st century version of grace? Only some have it, uh, so they're superior to the rest because they, have, they are right-thinking people, and it enables almost a pure form of priestly condescension uh, complete with a cancel culture uh, to be uh, to be heaped on others, um, which is the current locution for what used to be called back in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, shunning, cancel culture, shunning, two different pieces of language for the same same thing. Uh, uh, virtue signaling, this performative virtue sig signaling that we see we see on on campuses in particular, um, it, it looks a lot like a votive act. If you know anything about the Catholic Church, the idea of, you know the saying of something as equivalent to doing it, it's, it, it kind of reminds me of a voting act, shaming. Shaming is easy because it's still called shaming. It's nice to know that some vocabulary doesn't change. Um, and what is this obsession with victimhood on the social justice? I mean, not, not that it's not real. I mean, there, there's a, obviously there's, there's a real basis for this, uh, but, 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 the, uh, but the vaulting of this into a theological, you know, kind of a political theology mode, what is this, what is this obsession with vic victimhood except the old martyrology complex of Christianity, but modernized? The main difference being that you don't actually have to die to experience martyrology, which is an improvement, I think, on the concept. Um, uh, this is a very Christological movement, it seems to me. Uh, as one observer put it, and I'm quoting, I'll quote anonymously, it's the water in the Christological goldfish bowl. To be blessed, you must be meek, poor, persecuted, hungry, hated, excluded, reviled, or weeping, and preferably some combination of, of the two. And what is the insistence on the ubiquity of systemic racism in the United States right, according to some people, uh, except the transmogrification of the Catholic doctrine uh, that insists on the ubiquity of the body, the body of Christ, which is why you can have the mass all over the world, right? And even more basically, right, the Christian doctrine that insists on the complete moral smothering of humanity in its understanding of original sin. Everybody is tainted. Everybody is sinful. Everybody is guilty. Always has been, still is. And if you can't read the Christological elements in, in the way of thinking of, of the woke crowd, then um, I would ask you to try again. And here I want to read, ah, got to find last thing. This is from a family newsletter. I won't identify who wrote it, but this is a young person in their 30s. And sometime toward the beginning of June, this is what 
this person wrote to um, the family, all right? And tell me what you think. If this doesn't sound like a religious confessional to you, then just listen, all right? I'm quoting now anonymously from this family member. We both grew up in predominantly white communities. We never feared the police. We never worried that systemic racism, racism could kill someone in our family. We believed that if we were kind to people of color, we were not racist. We were sure that white supremacy culture existed only among extreme violent white nationalists. We had the luxury of ignoring the perspectives of black activists and disregarding activist movements for racial justice. We're learning that simply being kind to people of color is not enough. We're learning that no matter how exceptional we are or how good our intentions, we have deeply embedded racist beliefs and behaviors. Every American does. Every American does. We're learning that racism and white supremacy culture are like pollution in the air and poison in our water. It's impossible to avoid inhaling or consuming them. Racist ideas are reinforced in classrooms, political speeches, movies, advertising, social media. White supremacy culture shapes our legal and political systems. It seeps into the way we think, the way we act, the way we live our lives. It's so omnipresent, we're blind to the fact it's there. All right? Uh, and I'll just stop. We're learning that having racist ideas and living in a white supremacy culture does not make us inherently bad people. We have the ability to learn, to grow, repent, in other words, change, and so forth, right? I mean, if, if that doesn't sound to you like, like a religious confessional language, then I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what does. So I, I, think, I, think, we're, I think we're in this, in this, in this moment of uh, a part of a great awakening that's been elicited by all of these events that, that we all know, including the pandemic, uh, which has got everybody's you know, tether up. And that's what we're seeing. These are some of the moving parts that we're seeing. And last thing, you know, personal, just a pers quick personal note. I'm pretty old. Uh, I actually was born in 1951. I know Evan is shocked to hear that. I grew up in segregation. I grew up in Virginia. I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember the two drinking fountains and the three bathrooms at the drugstore store down down the street from my house. And if you can't imagine what it means, what I what I if you can't in, in visualize what two drinking fountains and three bathrooms mean, count yourself lucky. All right. Um, and uh, the people who say now that things are worse than ever for people of color in the United States uh, just don't know what they're talking about. Uh, things are dramatically better. Uh, they're not good enough. As I said before, it's a struggle that's going to take a very, very long time. We may never completely eradicate the problem. Almost no other society has. I really do think, by the way, that the United States is the most successful mass diverse racially diverse country in the world uh, if you don't if you don't agree try to name me name me one that does a better job um, you think Brazil does I'll tell you how to cure you cure you with thinking that Brazil <laughs> does a great job just go there and look around right? you'll see differently uh, for all the flaws um, I don't know of any country historically that's done a better job than the United States despite all the problems the vast problems that remain so you know, that's why I say the reaction to the George Floyd thing, I think, was a, a good thing. Uh, I think it's reason for some optimism that we will continue to make progress on these on these very, very difficult issues as we go forward. Um, we're in a very bad patch right now because part of our political culture is trying to weaponize these these uh, these fears and these anxieties um, uh, for, you know, for, for selfish political purposes. And I, and I don't in my lifetime, there's I've never seen leadership that irresponsible um, in the White House. I've seen some presidents I haven't liked, but I've never seen anything like this. And leadership matters. The quality of leadership matters. Uh, and we don't have it right now in the United States. So what happens on November 3rd, 4th, whatever, uh, is of enormous importance, even though I think the real sources of what we're seeing are far deeper in the culture and have been many, many more years in gestating. It's not just about politics. It's about stuff that's, that's very deep down in American society and culture. And I'll stop there. Great. Uh, Adam, thank you so much. Uh, once again, you have given us a, uh, a, a sweeping uh, tour of the horizon. I mean, I counted Rousseau, Hobbes, Ayn Rand, Andrew Sullivan, John Maynard Keynes, George Whitfield, Winning, William Jennings Bryan. And that's just a very partial list of your references. Uh, uh, we do have a few minutes to, to talk about, uh, or sorry, to, to answer questions. I have my own rather genteel question to ask you, but I'm going to hold off because uh, some of the questions from the audience are uh, much more pointed and much more critical than mine. 
uh, and I want to give you a chance to respond. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there, there, there are several questions that I can condense into one because they all found your top, your, your treatment of the subject to be biased. Uh, so one, uh, one viewer says that listening to your talk uh, came across as a defense of Trump. It is what it is, con uh, characterization of COVID and by extension racism. Uh, another, uh, another person said that, uh, uh, that you mischaracterize Antifa as being the sort of chief problem here, the chief problem group and uh, treat Antifa and, uh, and, 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 and white nationalists as being equivalent to one another in some manner. Uh, a third uh, viewer said that uh, your your inv invocation of the phrase "black on blue violence" is is uh, quote offensive and disingenuous, and shows an ignorance of the fact that the Bla Black Lives Matter movement was not responsible for the violence you cite. So, how would you? Uh, again, this is such a, 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 a this is such a, a fraught topic where it's almost a, it, this reminds me of almost uh, of talking about the Israeli Palestinian dispute. There's no way to walk through this minefield without offending yeah. any number of people. Uh, no matter how uh, unbiased you think you are. Uh, so what, well, how would you respond to, to, to those sorts of uh, criticisms that uh, you, you, you're, 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 not, you're being insufficiently critical to one side and overly critical to the other? Well, I'm sorry if it came across that way, because I, 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 I think I criticize pretty much everything. The, the, the idea that I could be, I could be shilling for a pro-Donald Trump I really don't understand how anybody who listened to what I said can conclude that. I loathe Donald Trump. How many times that I, I said he was a he was an extinction level event for American constitutional government? Does that sound like uh, I support Donald Trump? I mean, that just that just baffles me. Um, I I, you know, I wasn't equating the importance of white supremacists uh, or you know militia movements and Antifa. I was simply saying that they both share a certain attitude toward human nature, that they're both very small groups, but that they feed off each other and that the media helps them do it. I don't think I made a judgment about which one was better or worse. I'm not particularly fond of either one of them. Um, I, I think they both ev they eviscerate uh, a kind of a sane, a sane pragmatic middle. Uh, they, they, uh, they tend to violence. Uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement didn't cause the violence. Uh, uh, the reaction to the police killing caused the violence. There are many, many factors that, that, uh, that go into uh, what created the violence, but some of the violence was deliberate and some of it was um, uh, uh, planned by, uh, uh, by Antifa. Uh, here's an example. In Baltimore, not too far from here, uh, a group converged on a statue of Christopher Columbus, which had just been erected, I guess, by the Italian American community, not all that many years ago. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, the statue is about several hundred meters from from the bay, from the harbor, and the statue ended up in in the in the harbor, in the water. All right. Now, the way you the way that the newspapers reported this, and again, the media I think has been not not great on this. Uh, the, the way the media reported this is okay. A bunch of people show up. Uh, they're protesting um, uh, uh, police police brutality and violence, which is totally legitimate. And next thing you know, this, you know, this eight ton statue ends up in, in Baltimore Harbor and not a word, not a word in, uh, in the media about who organized this, who paid for it, who rented the truck that took the statue from the pedestal to the harbor, not a word. Now, if, 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 anybody, if anybody thinks that, you know, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand people show up in a, uh, of an evening in Baltimore and the next thing you know, an eight ton statue is in the, in the harbor and this is spontaneous, <laughs> Nobody plans this. Nobody wants this to happen. This is not a demonstration for the. I mean, come on, don't be naive. Um, I, the Antifa people are not a bunch of Boy Scouts. They, everybody's well intentioned, of course, except except the criminally insane. Uh, but I don't give either side a pass. I don't think that's being being un uh, uh, being favoring one side or favoring the other. As I said, you know, look, I grew up in segregation. All right. Every time I think about it, I cringe. Um, I think I said three or four times that uh, the sin of slavery will take a long time to eradicate and must be worked through every generation must rededicate themselves to it. Didn't I say that at least twice? So anybody out there who thinks that I don't care about this issue, I've been living with this issue in the United States my whole life and you have not, all right? Uh, 
I, I just I just am very puzzled by this this uh, this caricature of what I said. Very puzzled. If, if I can just press, I, I think that this is an uh, sort of leads to a, a an important uh, point, and that is that you know. The, the fact remains that both of the people that are speaking today are not black. <laughs> we neither, you know, we're we're both Caucasian, and we, to, to what extent are 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 we able to uh, make any make comments on uh, the the lived uh, experiences of people who are those that are being discriminated against. I mean, to what extent can we vicariously empathize with them? And I just, there's uh, one attendee makes the following, again, a very pointed and, and, and contentious question, but I really want you to, to, re, to be able to respond to it. Uh, I grew up, this is an anonymous attendee, I grew up in the segregated deep south of the US, but as a black person, are things better? Yes, but I feared for my life then and I fear for my life now. Did you then, do you now? I doubt it, therein lies the difference. How can we, that's meaningful that's, that's comment right. on that experience. Well, that's right. Uh, I work for Condoleezza Rice, who, who grew up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama was arguably the most segregated city in the South. Uh, yeah, obviously, I can't, uh, I can't crawl into somebody else's life and live somebody else's life any more than, than that, than you can crawl into my life and live my life. But we do have the possibility of a reason. We do have the possibility of learning something from history rather than using it as a battering ram. Uh, we can make an honest effort to understand these things. We can talk to people. We can sit with people. All right. Uh, I've had uh, never never mind the personal things, but uh, look, one of the one of the problems that I have with identitarian politics and the way that Democrats, uh, some Democrats, have have. Uh, have managed the, the images over the years is it include black people as just one of a, a several victim, vic, so victim groups, women, homosexuals, whatever. And this is, this is to me obscene, all right? There is no, first of all, there's no group in Singapore, so there's no a, analogy to any, any group in Singapore, but there's no group in the United States, right? That has had the lived historical experience of African-Americans in North America. No other group was taken forcibly uh, across an ocean and pressed into chattel slavery. No other. No other group had families separated forcibly. No other group had males emasculated generation after generation. And people wonder why, you know, uh, Black African males today you know, have issues, right? No other group uh, was forcibly made to be illiterate, was not allowed to learn how to read and write. So to, 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 to lump the experience of Black Americans in with other uh, uh, real or imagined aggrieved groups in American society is obscene to me, all right? Um, I don't know what else I can say. Yeah, I'm, I'm not Black and I didn't, I didn't grow up in the Deep South and I just, that's true. But it doesn't mean that people can't learn from history, that people can't empathize. I, I don't believe in, in, um, in uh, uh, collective culpability, but I do believe strongly in collective responsibility to put things right. And when I was the editor of the American Interest, I went to the, uh, the publisher and I said, look, uh, we've stalled out in the United States. We are not paying attention to these issues of racial equity and racial justice. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. There's a big black middle class right now. We don't have public indignities like we did uh, you know, when, when I was a kid, but we've stalled out. Uh, we have stopped caring about this. Let's do a special issue on on this subject, and we did. And it didn't sell very well, um, but um, but we did. So you know, I I, I reject this this uh, idea that because uh, you know uh, someone isn't a woman, they can't understand anything about women's issues, or because someone isn't is isn't black, they can't understand anything. Of, this is this this is this group this group this biological essence idea. And it amazes me that, that people who think of themselves as progressives think this is a progressive idea because there's a precursor of the idea of biological essences. And we saw it in uh, the early part of the 20th century and it was called Nazism. This is not a progressive idea. If Adam, if I could exercise the prerogative of the moderator and extend our session by just three or four minutes so I can ask you my question. Uh, which is which really uh, it, it comes from a, a, a different perspective. Uh, I, I'm, I, my area of interest is American foreign policy and international security. So, uh, 
here's my question. It's going to seem a little weird to you, maybe. Is it possible that the United States is tearing itself apart right now because it lacks an external superpower adversary? I mean, during the Cold War, the United States had to present itself in order to win, in order to defend its own national security uh, and its own survival. It had to be the exemplar of liberal democratic government to the rest of the world and especially to the West. And it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, the interstate highway system and the civil rights bills of the 1950s and 60s respectively took place during the Cold War. It's not uh, coincidental that there was much more bipartisanship in the United States during the Cold War when you have an external adversary that brings different factions of the, the uh, uh, within a state together. And uh, is it possible that US hegemony is the source of its own undoing? The US is committing hegemonic suicide uh, because there just isn't an external competitor to keep the, keep the US honest. Yeah, there's a, there's a book called The Strange Death of American Liberalism by H.W. Brands, who's a history professor at University of Texas, who made this argument, made this very argument, and published the book right on the eve of 911, so nobody paid any attention to it, but it's a pretty good book. And his argument is, is that you know, the American attitude toward power, uh, organizing power domestically, is, is like that only uh, of Great Britain. Uh, for the very special experiences in two islands, Britain as an island off Europe and the United States as a Mackindrian world island, that when, when Americans and Brits think of power, the first thing they think of is how to diffuse it, how to uh, make it weak so that it can't affect liberty and, and uh, you know, those, the small platoons of social life, as Burke put it. Every other people in the world living on a chessboard cheek by jowl with other, other cultures, they think about how to make power um, uh, more usable. <laughs> how to augment it, not how to divide it and make it weak. So that's, that's true. And Americans are a very diverse country, very big country, spread out all, all over the place. So, you know, this idea that somehow there's a natural unity uh, to the American nation is a very nice applause line, but it's basically balderdash. Uh, mm -hmm. The regional differences and, and the differences in the hearth cultures of the, 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 the people who came to North America, you see this in, in, in David Hackett Fisher's wonderful book, Albion Seed, well, these people didn't like each other. And the difference back in those days on a, on a religious basis within Protestantism between Anglicanism and Calvinism was vicious. I mean, these were two opposing, you know, shards of the Protestant Reformation. So people didn't feel as though it was, you know, lovey-dovey in one country. And it's, and it's exactly right. It was only national security threats, foreign threats that, that created a temporary suspension and that allowed central authority to gain some credibility. And it's, 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 the, it's the, uh, the gaining of that credibility because of national security pressures that allowed the federal government to do things that it otherwise wouldn't, be able to do, wouldn't have been able to do. Now, H.W. Uh, Brands' example is, of course, you know, the Cold War. And as you point out, um, civil rights movement, desegregation, all that stuff took place in the heat of the Cold War. So the government had cash, the federal government had cachet, it had credibility on, you know, it, it banked the national security credibility, and then it used it, the liberal elites of those days, used it to try to make some progress on these domestic problems that had been festering for more than a century, right? Two centuries. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's, that's, why, that's why I said, yeah, they knew if they, did, if they didn't act, it would be communist propaganda. It would, it would, it, it, it would weaken their international position. Well, right? you know, I don't, it's a good question how much people really cared about what the Soviets were saying uh, back in those days, because they, they make things up. They still make things up. I, I, I never really studied that. Maybe, maybe you, you know, probably know more, a lot more about it than I do. But th what, that's one of the things that scares me about, about the, the wild exaggeration of the, the China threat. I mean, uh, it's a long story. We don't want to get into Sino-American rivalry right now, but clearly, um, uh, be partly because of the virus, but other reasons, uh, the Republicans are trying to instrumentalize fear and hatred of China. Uh, and I think it fits in with your, with your basic idea. This is a rally around the flag uh, kind, of, uh, kind, of, kind of way that the Republicans are trying to, 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 to get votes. They're trying to scare people about China and then harvest the fear, right? So I think that's, that, you know, that, that fits into the same dynamic uh, as your question implies. And that's why I'm scared because accidents happen. <laughs> when people manipulate uh, foreign relations for domestic political purposes. Accidents happen. Adam, thank you so much. I'm sorry that I had to dismiss a number of very good questions, uh, in, and it was entirely in the interest of time and to keep uh, us relatively close to uh, 
the end the end time of our session today. So uh, on behalf of all of our 70 odd participants, Adam, thank you so much for again a wonderful talk. And uh, you're you're you know I, I'm I may not agree with everything you say, but I'm certainly riveted for the entirety of uh, as always of the, uh, at the entirety of your of of your talks. And it's uh, it's it's always an education. So thank you so so much for agreeing to do this again. And you'll be doing it another what seven or eight hundred times by the time that the year oh. is over, right? God God, God forbid. I, I, <laughs> in my in my my understanding is is that there are three more webinars in this series, approximately one a month. So uh, sometime uh, toward the end of September, uh, the end of October, and then the last one will be after the, presumably if there's an election, uh, what a mess, after the election. And so uh, then we'll see what, uh, what the, 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 uh, the folks at RSIS want to do next, if anything. So there'll and be at least three, God willing, there'll be three more. And I want to thank all of our silent participants. It's a very weird experience to be uh, part of a talk in which you can't see or hear. It is weird any of the participants. So thank you all for being so patient with us today. And uh, with that, I think I can call this meeting to an end and Adam can enjoy the rest of his uh, dwindling evening. So thank you thank all you, very Evan. much. Thank you for moderating.